Yeah. Okay. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, uh, summarize for you a, a project that I'm working on um, that's uh, funded by Embry, um, where uh, I am uh, performing a uh, chip seek analysis of the NR4 nuclear receptor uh, transcription factor in C. elegans. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to kind of give you the, the, bio, the biology uh, of, the, of what I'm working on, uh, the questions that I'm, that I'm asking. Then um, I'm going to talk about CHIPSEQ, uh, which is where my collaboration is with uh, Dr. Kim down at uh, CCT. And I'll just sort of summarize the things that we're working on together and um, what we've done so far and where we're going in the future. Uh, the project, we're still kind of in the middle of the project, uh, really pretty much uh, in the early phases of, of just sort of getting the tools together. But um, sometimes this next month, uh, and into the summer, we're going to be really uh, involved in, in this data and, uh, and being able to get some information out of it. So uh, the broad objective of my project uh, is to, um, with respect to my collaboration with Dr. Kim, is to identify binding sites and candidate target genes of the NR4 nuclear receptor homolog and C. elegans using chromatin immunoprecipitation, followed by next generation sequencing, which is also called ChIP-seq, and specifically what uh, Dr. Kim and I want to do is, uh, is establish uh, and, va and validate a pipeline for the analysis of raw chip seq data. So what I'll be telling you is that when I introduce this technique uh, to you, um, what I'll be trying to get across is that it's, it's very much computationally intensive. And it involves uh, taking raw sequence data and having to map that data to a genome, call peaks, subsequently call genes, a very interested in motif discovery, uh, and I'll also talk about, um, in terms of a biologist utilizing, wanting to utilize computational data about some approaches that I'd like to see Dr. Kim and I work on that would, be, that would help me as a biologist extract use, useful information out of, out of uh, this data. So real, real quick, I work on the NL4 nuclear receptors, uh, transcription factors, they're, they're broadly conserved uh, throughout uh, uh, animals, and um, they have a lot of important physiological and developmental functions. I'm most interested in the functions uh, in regulating cell proliferation and cell differentiation because th these are the activities of this receptor that are most relevant to human disease, <clears throat> namely cancer, athero, uh, atherosclerosis, um, leukemia, uh, neurodegeneration, and, and uh, so on. And what we're trying to do is uh, I'm trying to understand the molecular pathways by which this transcription factor functions within the cell. Uh, to better understand uh, its role uh, in these, uh, these diseases. And I study this not in a mammalian system, but in a, in a model system, C. elegans, which is a free-living nematode, which uh, uh, most of you probably heard about. It's an extremely well-established model system. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good genetic model system for, for looking at uh, uh, cellular signaling pathways relevant to human disease. And the reason why it's such a good system is it has an invariant cell lineage such that uh, we know in every single worm when every cell divides and what that cell becomes. So if you're studying cell proliferation and cell differentiation and the pathways that regulate that, this cell lineage is, is, very, uh, is very, um, very useful and very powerful uh, from a geneticist uh, standpoint. So uh, basically, uh, we, um, we're investigating uh, the hypothesis in my lab for a while has been that uh, NHR6 exhibits dualistic function in regulating cell proliferation and cell differentiation. And so I have a lot of biological work that I've done up to this point. I'm not going to go into it a lot, but basically uh, NHR6 uh, is a homologue of, of NR4A and it, and it functions in somatic gonad development of a worm. And, and it functions in the development of a particular organ called the spermatheca, which is involved in oocyte ovulation and fertilization. Um, all my work up to this point has shown that, that, that NHR6 it is important for cell proliferation and cell differentiation in this organ. So therefore, we've adopted this as our sort of model organ system for dissecting these activities of this transcription factor. And what I want to point out over here is that uh, the cell lineage, again, of this particular organ system. Uh, and we're, we're interested in how it can regulate both processes. So we've got good phenotypic evidence, good genetic analysis that says it, it regulates both. And so we're interested in how to regulate these, these two uh, opposing processes, which is cell proliferation and cell differentiation, and it's something that's important to this transcription factor family in, in terms of human disease, because sometimes it affects cell proliferation, sometimes cell differentiation in human disease context. 
And so basically, uh, we're using this as a model model of the system. Uh, here's the lineage. And so basically, I'm interested in activities here, which is during the cell proliferation phase of the organ, and then later on here, which is activities during cell differentiation. So um, up to this point, I've been mostly doing classical genetics type studies, uh, mutant analysis, uh, identifying enhancers, suppressors. Uh, we do a lot of uh, we do a lot of genetic interactions, um, trying to get at uh, some of the pathways that NHR6 is involved in. And one of the things that I <clears throat> began to uh, learn just by going through the literature was that it'd be very nice if we could, on a global scale, genomic scale, be able to identify target genes for this transcription factor. And so uh, there's this technique called CHIP-seq, which is chromatin immunoprecipitation that's followed by next generation sequencing. And chromatin immunoprecipitation has been around for a while. It's basically where uh, you can uh, fix transcription factors down to their binding sites on DNA. And then you, you uh, fragment that DNA, isolate the DNA, reverse the crosslinks. And then usually using PCR, you then look to see if particular fragments of DNA are, are uh, enriched in your sample, meaning that your transcription factor binds uh, that particular region of DNA. Um, but now what you can do is you can generate these transcription factor bound fragments. And instead of doing target analysis, you can basically do massively parallel sequencing and identify all precipitated fragments in that sample. So it basically gives you a chance to see all, on a genomic wide scale, all the transcription factor binding sites for your transcription factor. And so uh, as a result of that, you generate a lot of sequence data. And you've got to be able to take that sequence data and get information out of it. So it's very computationally intensive. And so uh, I uh, adopted this approach uh, when, I, um, uh, when I started my new uh, Embry uh, project. And so, in order for this to um, in order this to work, we have to have some reagents in place. We have to be able to go into the worm and uh, pull. We're going to do immunoprecipitation, so we have to be able to go into the worm uh, and and identify DNA fragments that are bound to our transcription factor. And uh, we generated a reagent to do this, which is basically we took our pro, uh, uh, we took our protein and fused it to GFP. Uh, and demonstrated that it was fully functional in vivo, that is, it fully rescued the mutant, so that even though it's fused to GFP, it's, it, it works just like the regular receptor. You can see it's very tightly nuclear localized. This is just blowing up uh, the organ uh, here. And so basically, we used GFP as our epitope for the immunoprecipitation. Okay? Uh, and we did this uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, one reason is there's very good GFP antibodies out there as opposed to trying to find, get our own NHR6 antibodies and try to find some that will work in a chip experiment, there are chip qualified antibodies against GFP. So we didn't have to worry about getting one of our own for NHR6. Another reason we did this, and I'll talk about it later, is that there's a consortium called the Modern Code uh, Consortium, which is basically using the same approach to generate chip seq data for uh, a majority of seal against transcription factors. And we wanted to follow their basic approach so that we could, um, so that we could uh, uh, utilize some of their protocols, and as I'll show you, be able to compare some of our data uh, to their data. But basically, what we're going to do is, uh, what the, our, our experimental plan is to immunoprecipitate uh, NHR6-bound DNA during the early cell proliferation phase, and then immunoprecipitate NHR6-bound DNA in the cell differentiation phase. We hypothesize that these, the transcription factors at these two times have, have different activities, possibly what we think is regulated by different signaling pathways. And so what we want to see is different, uh, different activities in HR6 binding to target genes uh, in these two different developmental stages. So uh, doing a chip seq experiment uh, requires a lot of different steps. Uh, so basically, we have a whole animal here that's expressing our NHR6 fused to GFP. And I want to point out that NHR6 is, in the worm is only expressed in two cell types. It's only expressed in, in the spermatheca organ that we're studying uh, at the L3 and L4 stages, which is when the developmental events we're interested are going on. And then it's also the, expressed in two neurons, two chemosensory neurons throughout its life cycle. So it's, got, it's, got, uh, it's not very broadly expressed, okay? Um, which is good for us because most of what we'll get from this we'll be able to apply to our developmental system. Um, but the, the bad thing about that is it's not expressed in a lot of cells, and it's not very highly expressed. Therefore, it's going to be hard to get sufficient amounts of 
immunoprecipitated DNA because we just, you know, if you had a broadly expressed transcription factor at high levels, you know, you could just imagine it'd be like IP more DNA. But having having the uh, very few a number of cells uh, express a transcription factor uh, causes a uh, causes this to be a potential issue. And, but basically, um, we start off with the whole animal, we have to go through the process of sonicating and lysing the animal. Well, we have to fix the animal first to, to cross-link the transcription factor to the DNA, and then we have to sonicate and lyse the animal, uh, which also will fragment the DNA. And we have to uh, do optimizations to get at uh, as much fragmentation as we can without losing our epitope. Uh, and then we immunoprecipitate. And th this is a very established protocol in, in cell lines. In CLNs, it hasn't been done much, and it turned out to be a lot trickier than what we thought, and we spent basically over a year just getting this particular uh, part optimized, and so it took a lot longer than what we thought. But basically, uh, we can take it through this process. Uh, we can show by Western blot that in transgenics that express the GFP that we can IP the, the nuclear receptor detected by Western blot, and that we don't IP uh, signal uh, in non-transgenic animals. Uh, then we can uh, isolate DNA, uh, and then what I'm showing here is a DNA that we've isolated and run on an Agilent bioanalyzer. So basically the F and the I uh, are, indicate two independent transgenic lines. L3 is a, a larval stage here, FL3, IL3, that's the larval stage at which cell proliferation is occurring for this organ, and then at a particular point in L4 here is uh, during cell differentiation. So you can see we have four experimental samples here, two independent transgenic lines uh, for replication. In addition to this, this is our IP DNA. In addition to this, we have input DNA. And having input sequence DNA is important for uh, identifying uh, actual enriched, uh, uh, enriched, uh, sample, uh, enriched sequences within the sample. And so basically we shoot for uh, just about 275 base pairs, uh, and you can see, you see a nice peak in all these samples right around 275 base pairs after we're done with the whole procedure. Uh, but we have to grow up plates and plates and plates and plates of animals to get uh, this, just, this low nanograms amount of DNA. So it's quite a, a labor-intensive process. But once that DNA is, is, is isolated, we then are going to sequence it on the solid uh, <coughs> sequencing um, platform. Uh, we're going to do this in collaboration with Pennington uh, Genome Research um, Core facility, uh, where they have this solid system. And um, so basically, uh, we've basically taken everything through the DNA isolation, and now our our samples are now at Pennington, and we're just awaiting at some point for the whole process to be completed and get our data. Um, just to tell you, um, after you after you sequence, what happens? So here's your chip DNA that we isolate. Uh, when we send that down to uh, the Pennington uh, core facility, they will construct libraries of these fragments that are specific for the, the solid platform. Uh, they'll do the massively parallel sequencing. They will then give us back uh, data from this. And we have to take that data and then through a variety of algorithms, align that sequence data to the reference genome, uh, then use different algorithms to call peaks that is, uh, where in the genome do we see enrichment of sequences indicating a binding site, and then uh, various analyses and visualizations uh, after this to, to gain uh, biological information from, from the experiment. Um, so uh, in, terms of, um, in terms of analyzing the data, as I said, we have to map it uh, to the reference genome. We have to do, have use peak calling algorithms. Um, and you're going to get data that's at different levels of statistical significance. Um, and then once you kind of sort it through at that level, then there's downstream analysis, uh, identifying target genes, uh, motif searches, uh, gene ontology uh, types of analysis. Uh, and so in all of these things are, are, are with my collaboration with Dr. Kim down at, down at the uh, LSU CCT. Now, when we got started, when, we, when I contacted Dr. Kim, we were still in the process of getting our, uh, our wet bench stuff in place. We didn't have any chip seek data. But um, I still wanted to sort of get a head start. So this was, this, was new, this was new technology to me. It was new wet bench work to me, and plus it was very new in terms of technology, the bioinformatics I was not familiar with. And so I knew it was going to take a while for me to, to read the literature and get comfortable with everything. And so uh, to, to, to begin, 
this collaboration and begin to, to make some progress on it uh, uh, early, uh, we utilized a uh, modern code. So there's a, a consortium called ENCODE, which uh, is uh, run by the National Human Genome Research Institute. And, um, uh, and what, what, what ENCODE does is for, for mammalian transcription factors in a variety of different conditions, is to use Chipsy to identify transcription factor, uh, transcri transcription factor binding sites for different transcription factors under different uh, conditions. But there's also a modern code, which is for model organisms. And so modern code does this for Drosophila, and they do it for C. elegans. And so uh, when I went through and looked, and, and you know they, they have a website, and you can go through that website, and you can look uh, at the experiments that they're doing and download data. Uh, I found that they were doing uh, NHR6 experiment and a, a CHIPSI uh, experiment, and uh, and as I said before, the way modern code does uh, their CHIPSI, they use the same process that we do. That is, where, where they use C terminal tag GFP transcription factors that they express in the worm, and then use anti GFP antibodies. And so we found that they had done an NHR6 experiment. But they did it at a different developmental stage. So the developmental stage they did theirs at was at the L2 stage. Uh, the developmental event that we work on is not until the L3, L4 stage. But nonetheless, there is NHR6 expression in neurons at this stage. And so I thought that this would be good to go in, get their raw data, uh, and begin to go through some different pipeline options uh, to begin to, to sort of wade into the shallow end of the pool, if you will, with this technology and with these um, different computational approaches, and just kind of learn our way around it, and um, and it also would be nice as a comparison when we got our data to see uh, what uh, if there's any, uh, for example, any binding sites in common between the two different experiments, what's different, and so on. So a nice comparison. Uh, so we, we we went in in a modern code. They uh, they did their chip seek with a, a different uh, sequencing platform, the Illumina platform. So you can actually go into modern code and download their peak their their final data, which would be peak calling data, statistical that's been uh, statistically analyzed. Or you could go in and download their raw data and take the raw data and then run your own uh, uh, algorithms. So. An uh, MS student of mine, Rashika Rangaraj, who's uh, wrapping up her thesis this semester, did an Embry summer research project with Dr. Kim. And basically what they did is they took the raw modern code data and began to run a variety of different analyses on it. So they looked at different uh, mapping programs. Uh, we did some PCOG analysis with a program called Max. And then we worked on some visual, they worked on some visualization of the data uh, through the USC, UCSC genome browser. Uh, during this time, uh, Dr. Kim was also working on the DARE NGS system, which he'll talk about, and, uh, and I'll, I'll bring up uh, briefly again here in a minute. And basically, what we did is just basically learn the algorithms, uh, try some different mapping, try some different peak calling, uh, generated our own analysis of the raw data, compared that to what modern code did, uh, and to see uh, to see how the different the different algorithms compare to each other. Um, and we also did some initial meme analysis to discover motifs, and I'll come back to that uh, in a little bit. So basically, uh, here's a, um, a, visual, a visualization tool uh, through the UCSC genome browser. So basically, uh, Rashika uh, uh, did a max analysis and then was able to upload uh, that data into the UCSC genome browser. And uh, basically what you have here, um, these are genes, C. elegans genes here. This red arrow indicates uh, the uh, max binding site peak or summit. Uh, these uh, these uh, areas here are regions of conservation between C. elegans and related nematodes. So there's genome sequences for four or five cinerapidated species uh, that are uh, that are you know, in, uh, on a range of hundreds of millions of years, hundreds of millions of years or so diverge from C. elegans. And so what this does is, is where you see uh, nice uh, blue peaks here, that indicates high conservation between all of these other nematode genome sequences. And this is very important, obviously, in identifying functional, ele functional elements in the genome. Uh, amongst these nematodes, uh, you would expect, uh, you would, you would expect um, where there's high conservation to be functional elements that are, that are um, very uh, uh, 
very broadly conserved. So you can see here, this is the five prime in of the gene. Here's a conserved area here, close to the five prime in. You kind of expect that, but then even upstream, you see there's other regions of, of, of conservation upstream of the gene. And if you look at our little peak here, uh, it resides within a very highly conserved area. So this is a very useful visualization for both pointing your peak next to a gene as well as determining whether it resides in a broadly conserved uh, region of the genome. Um, so going through this exercise, some of the things we learned is that uh, we have that different mapping and different peak calling algorithms give these di different results. As a matter of fact, we found that we get uh, dramatically different results depending on, uh, depending on what peak calling algorithm you use. Uh, and this, uh, this difference is in the number of peaks that are actually called, uh, the boundaries of those peaks, and uh, differences there are very important for looking at downstream analyses, that is, you know, uh, target genes, as well as uh, uh, identifying binding site motifs. And so uh, from this exercise, uh, we've determined that multiple mapping and peak calling algorithms are likely to be useful, that we use multiple approaches as opposed to one approach uh, to get the best possible uh, analysis of the data uh, to uh, begin to um, dive in and, like I said, try and pull something of, of, of significance out of it. Um, should also point out that uh, <coughs> when we sequence on solid, we will get uh, uh, an analysis done through, uh, uh, through a company called LiveScope or a software analysis called LiveScope that's going to give us their proprietary peak calling um, uh, data. Um, and we'll also be able to get that raw data as well uh, and for our, our additional analysis. So we'll, we'll get, we'll get, we'll get um, analysis of that sequence data from a variety of sources, uh, from, from the, the work that we do, as well as what comes back from, from the sequencing platform. So here's just some of the, uh, the, the things that we've observed in, certain, in terms of differences. So here's a, a summary where we've, you know, we've compared two mapping programs, BWA and Bowtie. Um, Max, we did this with the, with the, the, the Max uh, software program. <coughs> Basically, Max gives you uh, a false discovery rate percentage that tells you uh, whether or not a binding site uh, uh, is, ha has some significance. And basically, uh, FDR percent of zero is the best, and the higher you go FDR, uh, the, less, um, the less sure you are about whether or not that represents a binding site. And so you can see, uh, just comparing uh, Comparing BWA and orange and bow tie and gray, that you get different, you get different numbers of peaks at different levels of FDR values. Okay, so uh, just using a different mapping program and the same uh, peak calling program gives you different numbers of peaks at different uh, levels of significance. We found dramatic differences when we analyzed our data with the peak seek data at Modern Code. Uh, so remember, we took the same raw data that Modern Code used in their peak calling, and we put it into our pipeline, and we saw dramatic differences. Um, Max identified fewer than 1,300 peaks at a p-value of, um, of less than uh, minus 05, whereas peak seat called about five times, uh, five times that. So that's a pretty, it's a pretty big difference. Um, and uh, uh, we also, uh, in addition, Max called very, very few peaks, only six peaks out of those 1,300 that had a low FDR. So Max was giving us fewer peaks and a very, 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 very small number of significant uh, peaks at a low uh, FDR rate. So uh, this just indicates that, again, that these, these, even using the same raw data set, different algorithms, we're getting dramatically different uh, outputs. Uh, here's another way uh, for C. elegans. Genesis, another good way to visualize the data. This is actually uploading Max data within WormBase. So this is a WormBase output. So this is a, a, a genome output here. You can see our Max peaks here. You can see uh, genes. Uh, so you can see the relations of our Max peaks to various genes in the genome. What's great about being able to upload this into WormBase is that we can very rapidly go to WormBase information on these genes from this website and immediately get information as well as download uh, the actual sequence that's associated with those max peaks. Okay, so these are, these are very useful uh, visualization tools. So, in addition to, to seeing these different results from the different algorithms, another challenge that we have encountered is motif searching. So when we, we get this chip data, 
we want to we want to do two things. One, we want to identify a set of target genes. Second thing we want to do is we want to determine the NHR uh, the NHR6 binding site. And so Meme is a is a program by which you can uh, upload uh, this chip seek data, and, uh, and and it will search uh, in an unbiased way based on its algorithm for uh, sites that are found within um, these these uh, this, these uh, chip seek sequences. Um, now, NR4A uh, has a canonical site that, that the vertebrate ones bind to, as well as uh, NHR6. It's only an eight-base base pair motif. Um, and basically what happened was, Mean failed to uncover this motif in any of our uh, data. So Mean failed to pull out what was, would be considered uh, the canonical binding site. Now, that may, that may, uh, can't really, can't really draw any major conclusions from that. It's very possible that NHR6 doesn't bind. That you have a question? Yeah. So what did you specify as your background set for me to use when it's uh, The background set. You have to supply a background set to me. Because it's, it's looking for a statistical enrichment of mm -hmm. something in the sample that you're giving right. it relative to a background. And what background you give will greatly influence the results. <clears throat> Well, we didn't try. We just uh, the take the uh, peak reason from in a chip seek analysis. Uh, but as you a, had to give the genome then as the background. Did you give it the whole genome, or just the intergenic regions? Play with this, okay? Okay, we'll play with that. Play with that. Okay. Um, uh, so yeah, so yeah, so it didn't uncover, which we were surprised. We didn't know if it was maybe the size of the teeth, but HR six could also have some unexpected binding properties. Um, and you never know what to, ex what to expect with that. Um, but I can say that, you know, the, the NHR6 DNA binding domain is very well conserved. There's definitely some constraints in terms of what kind of sequences it would, it would bind. So if NHR6 does bind DNA and we have genetic evidence that NHR6 functions through this DNA binding domain, that we would expect to be able to find at least things that are similar to that canonical site, uh, which we didn't find. Um, and so, in addition to working more with MEME, uh, which I think we need to, to go into that a little bit more, uh, we're also exploring uh, some more biased approaches. Uh, so there's a couple um, possibilities here. Um, I'm currently right now doing an extensive search for all the, 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 the experimentally verified um, binding sites for the, for, the, for the vertebrate in our forays, and we can then build um, a uh, position weight matrix and, and search in a biased way for, 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 those, um, for those sites as well as uh, searching these sites uh, with transcription factor databases. And I'll point out, I, I took a subset of peaks um, from, the, from our data and just did some simple text searches and was able to uncover in some of the peak areas of uh, the canonical site. So Meme was definitely missing some things that might, that might be there. Um, but this is something that, uh, that, is, that is very important, uh, both in terms of um, identifying uh, target genes as well as being able to characterize what the, the in vivo binding site is for, for NHR6. Um, so in terms of thinking ahead, uh, and, and, and uh, again, from the standpoint of biologists, we're gonna get a lot of data. If you look, um, if you look for example, at the peak seek data you get from modern code, it's a huge Excel file. Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, the peak seek file that we got from modern code was 17,000 genes. And it was, it was easy to filter it to different levels of statistical significance on, on Excel, but it's, but it's still pretty, pretty daunting to have to try and plow through all that and, and get some useful, useful information. So one of the things we want to do is uh, do some gene ontology analysis and, and, sort, uh, and sort these peaks um, based on predicted gene function. So for example, um, our major hypothesis is focusing on cell proliferation and cell differentiation. So one of the things we want to look at first is to pull out target genes that are um, that that are, are predicted to function in those processes, and so that would be one useful um, approach that, that that we would like to use. Um, sequence extraction uh, is very important. Max gives you a single summit, gives you a single position. Peak seek gives you an interval, um, and in order to do motif searching, you have to you need to supply an interval. So if you get max, and it just gives you a summit sequence, you know, you're gonna take 100 to 200 base pairs on either side of that summit sequence that you're gonna to wanna to use for motif analysis. So to be able to 
rapidly extract that information, sequence information, would be very useful. At this point, uh, my, grad, my graduate student had to do this by hand for 200 sequences uh, when we did our initial uh, motif analysis. So we're interested in being able to uh, maybe, uh, maybe um, uh, uh, rapidly extract sequence for, for analysis. Um, binding site conservation is another thing we're looking at. Uh, in terms of looking at uh, some motifs, what you might want to do is focus on on, peak, on on binding sites that are found in broadly conserved areas. So if there was a way that we could go in and rank our genes, again, by, uh, by binding site conservation amongst uh, those other genomes, like you saw in the UCSC browser, that would be very helpful in terms of, of generating ranked lists of genes uh, for the subsequent analysis. And if we're going to have multiple peak calling programs, uh, Dr. Kim and I have talked about whether or not there's possibilities that ways that we can uh, visualize different outputs from different peak calling algorithms in a way that, that we can identify where there's differences and where there's similarities and so on. So these are some of the things that I see that uh, if there was ways to customize the analysis that would be very useful, uh, very useful for, for me to uh, begin to extract uh, information from this data. And um, with that, I just want to acknowledge uh, Rashika, who's a master student. Jeremy Harmson is a technician in my lab, who's been very helpful with the web desk work. And then uh, Dr. Kim, my uh, Henry mentor, and then funding by Henry. I'll take any questions. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Um, so I know this is the computational meeting, so I, I, uh, I'll meet myself now for suggesting wet lab. And I don't know if this is something that Gus can do in the molecular core or not. Have you just thought about doing a mobility shift assay, just synthesizing the oligo of the canonical site, mm -hmm. and then put, adding it to your protein extract, extracts and seeing if you get a shift? I mean, well, I've already, we've already shown that it binds the canonical site. I mean, we've already, we've already done all that. Okay. So we know when HR6, we know when HR6, it, it binds, it binds uh, the canonical site and variants of the binding site, and we've also shown that in mammalian cell lines, it can activate transcription. Okay. And then, so if you're looking for an alternative site, then, mm -hmm. which is, I guess, what you would be doing, have you, have you explored the protein binding arrays that I've looked at? I, I've, looked at I've looked them up, but I haven't, I haven't gotten into um, to going, uh, you know, I, I had, had time to really think about yeah. getting started on that. Um, you know, again, that, that's, the, 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 I think that's, I think it's, I think this could be very useful for maybe possibly finding some other sites. Um, but, um, I, I think if, if NHR6 is binding to DNA in the way that the, the, um, that the, the vertebrate ones bind DNA, again, it's very conserved DNA binding domain, uh, and there's been a lot of structure function studies done with this protein. And so there are some key constraints, and most everything that comes out from the vertebrate studies is some variation of that canonical site. So if it's binding DNA in the same manner in C. elegans, it should be binding to something similar to the canonical site. Unless it's, unless it's heterodimerizing, that, that's altering its its abilities, or or maybe binding indirectly. You know, that's always. So what a possibility. about knocking out the binding site upstream of one of these genes? Is it ever unbelievable? Upstream of the. Up, upstream of one of your development genes. I guess it wouldn't be ever. They'd just be steroids, but I mean. Well, yeah. I mean, that, those are some of the things that we're. Those are some of the things that we're going to do. I mean, once we once we identify some target genes, um, you know, and whether or not we think that's a good candidate target gene that has a motif or not. You know, then we moved. That, that's the downstream. That's the downstream experiment. Then we move. We, you know, we generate reporter constructs. We see if it's uh, regulated. Uh, we see if its ex expression is altered in the mutant and wild type. We mutate the site. And, yeah, those are all the downstream things that we really want to do. But uh, it's it's you know getting the data and being able to come up with a a list of genes that we feel are 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 high quality target genes. Right. So uh, well, given so that we're quite late on time, uh, just so we can yep. end on time without eliminating, uh, maybe if you can go on, Chukun, and we can take later okay. questions later. Okay. And Chukun, if you can limit to 15 minutes, that'll leave us five minutes for closing, and then we can well, declare victory. Yeah, he's not. <laughs> okay. Very good. I just know that some people have to make the other parts yeah. of the state yeah. before uh, <laughs> midnight arrives. So I'm going to talk about in a, uh, uh, web-based tool, um, which was used by you know, the, this collaboration, and I'm mostly uh, um, the focusing on the subswide in you know, the aspect. So skipping in you know, a biological motivation, 
uh, which was already described well by you know, Chris, and the uh, technical and uh, and uh, details, you know, which is not probably you know, interesting to you, yeah, this audience. Uh, okay. So we developed the ChIP-SIG pipeline tool, which is provided by their NGS. So we call their NGS a science, science gateway. Um, No, you have to go into the monitor. Oh, yeah. You turn on mirroring and just have to Just go over, open up your preferences. Preferences on the top. Yeah, but that's just the way it's You're going to have to go back and turn it up to the display. Click on it and go to system preferences. And then monitors. I think it's just because it was a Windows computer on your first. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> Interest PCs compatibility issues. Detect displays. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. And then turn on mirror. You got it. Okay. So this is about their NGS Science Gateway, which has many, many you know, the service tools and you know, focusing on the next general sequencing data analytics. Uh, so okay, so I'll give you in you know, five minutes in you know, a background and motivations and five minutes kind of demo. So hopefully you, know, the, you understand the current status, also some interest you know, for the future working with us and you know, for your you know, own interest, like you know, Chris actually you know, the shows some examples. So uh, so we have uh, their NGS, you see the form for the service for especially chipset. And the, very quickly, the background of our approach is to achieve scalable NGS data analytics using high performance distributed computing. Okay? So actually, the real calculation can be run on remotely on uh, high performance computing machines or in a cloud environment. But you are, uh, hit, you are hitting the web page, so submit a very simple form with your data set. So you know, the lowering the kind of barrier on you know, the computational task, you know, which is sometimes very you know, demanding for you know, individual biologists. So we develop you know, the, their framework, which is very flexible and also supporting you know, the distributed computing you know, the, seamlessly. So, so I don't know, emphasize one thing with scalability. You might think scalability is needed because the data size, data volume is large. Well, in addition to that, you know, the unique kind of in you know, the situation, real scalability. Because as you see, you know, one single tool doesn't tell you perfectly everything. Okay, especially NGS is based on huge deep sequencing and you know, high throughput technology producing very short read, which is enormously you know, shorter than in the real genome. So tons of technology was trying, and then still you know, many, many interesting aspects of you know, the analysis still remains in elusive. And it, depending on the technology evolves, and your uh, computation and strategies should be changed. So scalability is not only just in you know, dealing with in you know, a large data set, you have to be uh, flexible to deal with the new you know, the generation of tools and new ideas on building on your pipeline uh, based on your biological interest. Okay, so we actually you know, the successfully you know, the demonstrate our framework development and in the gateway uh, is very useful for next generation sequencing data analysis and downstream you know, analysis. So you know that you know, the 
within 10 years, especially in a six, say eight years with national sequencing platform and biomedical, biological research areas, I think dramatically change you know, the perspectives and scope of you know, research interest and show you, you know, the, the cost down. So one of the main driver is the cost is so effective. Uh, you heard about you know, the, uh, Jessica, you know, the early times, you know, it has you know, multi-billion dollars for one genome. But now I think less than 10,000 and you know, probably possible you know, the, with you know, one single human genome. So these are um, the institutions around southern you know, the Louisiana, I don't know northern Louisiana here, but uh, there are several you know, experimental platforms already available. So you can contact and look at you know, the opportunity you know, which really you know, the increase you know, the, your research you know, the, uh, scope. So, so this is uh, something brief on you know, the required computational task with uh, sequencing. Not only just you know, the sequence your you know, the target genome, more importantly, you know, cell differentiation and development and gene regulation expression uh, mechanism require transcriptome analysis and also chipset which shows in you know, a DNA protein binding uh, eventually giving you chromatin structure so epigenetics all kinds of new you know the discovery possible and you know kind of entire genome wise information not only just in you know, a small you know the range of you know, your gene set or protein pathway okay so that's really you know the uh, uh, encouraging and you know, the, the, the fascinating, but you also have some trade-off. Need a lot of you know the, the very you know the dirty chip in the, the data analysis. Okay, so the NGS has been developed. See the variety of uh, different types of analysis uh, were considered. So especially this is a, a chip sick, <coughs> especially with C. elegans and Dr. Uh, group. So okay. So let me just summarize. So the NGS supports scalable calculation with you know, distributed computing. Okay. Um, so you don't care whether you know, the, the, any what kind of you know, back end machines are used, but it is actually you know, scalable with this you know, capability. And also framework. You know, the, we don't develop just you know, the web tool or web interface. We developed their framework, which give you you know very efficient development cycle and also extensible you know the infrastructure like Science Gateway. So we successfully you know the increase the number of service in a very short time scale. Okay, and you know, the Science Tapper Gateway you know the, is very uh, useful. Um, you know, the actually the connecting you know biologists to you know, many interesting scientific computing with simple and intuitive interactive interface. So uh, the, the usefulness uh, cannot be an understated. Okay. So this is one example. I use actually <coughs> 56 cores, which is mostly you know the located uh, in Texas. Okay, and then. I decrease time and you know, the not scale very well because you know the complexity of time computer test is not uh, expected to be you know, scaled well. But anyway, we decrease time significantly. Okay. All right. So this is another example. You know, we implemented uh, some uh, so-called MapReduce, which is a very good strategy for parallelizing. In your computational test or data management, I think this is going to be a next in you know, a uh, core tool for I think any kind of bioinformatics in you know, the area. So it shows in you know, our implementation, and you know, with more resource you're going to use, and you have you know, the load in you know, the computing time. Okay. So, okay. So this is uh, again you know, the, I'm working with uh, Rashika closely. Uh, she's doing you know, the many the, expert, the, the computational tasks and then you know, the discuss with you know, his boss, Chris, so we do you know, some you know, kind of preliminary you know, work, as you saw, shown. So, ChipSec, 
generally in a drug is composed of two step mapping and peak calling. And I want to show you, you know, if you change in you know, a program for mapping, you want to have a different result. If you change peak calling, also you want to have a different result. Also, chip sick and you know, is gonna be followed by many downstream analysis. Probably you are interested in this kind of analysis, and there are tons of you know alternative choice and many, many ideas as right? we discuss a bit. So we don't know how actually you know, some you know, the aspect you know, could impact dominantly or less impact. Okay? So what I'm suggesting is do whatever you want. Okay? Then you know you get all kinds of different results and based on your biological insight you choose the right one. Okay? I think that's the right strategy. Uh, but unfortunately most of you know, the works that I you know, the learn from literature, they do what they know. Okay? So we don't know actually you know, the but, and also many you know, the experiments you know, tells you, you know, especially review articles, you know, emphasize validation of any single tool is extremely difficult for, for example, RNA-seq or chip-seq data analysis. Okay? So that's the motivation. And I'm going to show you very simple. So their NGS which is in there.ccc.lsu.edu. So you just remember there the words, and you're gonna see this welcome page. And their NGS is one of you know, main gateway. And so their NGS has several tools already, and many tools, especially focusing on RNA-C, uh, actually on the way. So we have TRIPC, right? And then you just go to uh, Form so this is a CBW12, and you can choose your reference genome. So we're gonna talk about we're gonna do you know with CL one right? So I can choose many tools, but uh, let me try Bowtie, which is the simplest, efficient, uh, but you know not sensitive at all you know, in many aspects, but. Uh, People are familiar with that. So, uh, color space support, meaning you, know, you can do solid in you know, a platform bit also, and we choose max, okay? So now you have two input files. So, currently, you know, if you wanna use this service, you have to come to us with your data, whether your own data or some data you, know, you found on the web. So if you contact us and send us the data set, because sometimes the size is not you know, the, uh, small, you can send with email. So, but you, know, you just can send us with other you know, data transfer method. Then we will store them, so you can choose if you find your own. So this is control data, so here. And you have uh, um, input, data, input data, right? So this is a puppet and uh, input and output. And you can actually choose many different machines, okay? So for just uh, simple demonstration, you know, we use in a small, which means the calculation run on the server, so you can quickly uh, get the response. And then you wanna see the job table, which shows you know, the status of your job. So job is just created, okay? It's gonna run. So I'm gonna show you the um, so other jobs which one is done, okay? Uh, how you actually extract output. For example, you can download output, right? So you can save it. And then, which have, we have some in a <coughs> couple of in a, the, in a post processing tool, which is genome browsing. So if you click using genome browser, okay? Right, so it is connecting in a mode encode um, the website and all the automatically you know, the invoke C elegance and then you know the, you can easily upload your file, just download. Okay, let me see. So right. 
click and upload and go to browser uh, the resolution is bad here but um, you're gonna see your data set you just upload it here okay so you just saw you know the something interesting result just changing the reason you know, as Chris showed so within a couple of minutes once you get a data you know you can look at you know, immediately the location and uh, this website especially have a lot of interesting you know the, you know, the, the sequencing based you know, or microarray based you know, the, um, the information for example SMP is there so you can look at immediately so we can add more you know the um, on this tool like me, you know, well, easily you know, incorporate you know, external you know, the web tools or we can just embed you know, the, if they allow to install you know, their you know, the tools. So you know, you can, we can provide an integrated one. Okay, so I hope you get some idea. Uh, hopefully you know, the, uh, you're going to be interested in with your problem and you know, helping us extend you know, the service which is going to be also useful to you know, others. Okay? Wonderful. Yes. Uh, let's make time for one short question, if we have one. Uh, do we have one short question for Shuyang? Then let me ask one short question. Um, okay. If there is a PI who is just preparing or in the middle of some Alzheimer's related work and they were really inspired by the work that uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Kissinger showed and you showed and they were trying to think what they would need to be budgeting in their R15 to try to add some behavior, add some functionality for Illumina or 454 towards some particular domain. Do you have any sort of first instinct about what sort of human investment they could imagine might bring what sort of computational results? So as I emphasize, we actually heavily invest in the framework, not just tool. So I would suggest you know, if you have some kind of you know, funding opportunity and some interesting you know, the research, which is associated with you know, sequencing data analysis, or you know, the, I think a project uh, we talk about you know, some kind of functional genomic study, uh, you know, microarray data analysis and path analysis could be easily you know, utilized for your own you know, research or funding. So that I think you know, provides some. You know, so contact you for yeah. logistics, but you're enthusiastic yeah. Yeah. about engaging with people mm -hmm. as the interest comes up. Yeah, great. Yeah. Thank you very much again.